The 4th of April 2021 marks the 100 year anniversary of an ambush that took place along the main street fronts during the War of Independence in 1921. By April of that year, the War of Independence had been raging for over two years in Ireland, and the activities of the IRA had vastly reduced the capabilities of the Royal Irish Constabulary Police Force to operate. During this time, it saw a huge reduction in its numbers. In 1920, 3,229 officers left the RIC, with a further 3,208 resigning in 1921. By early 1920, the force was augmented by the arrival of the Black and Tans, shortly followed by the arrival of the Auxiliaries. By this time, many barracks in rural locations, where they were more prone to attack, had been vacated by the police and were subsequently either sabotaged or burned by the IRA, so that they could not be utilised again by the ground forces, further reducing their capability to operate while increasing that of the IRAs. In County Wexford alone, a total of 23 barracks were either burned or sabotaged in 1920. By 1921, only a handful of barracks were still operational in the county, garrisoned by a combination of RIC and Black and Tans. These were located in either large towns or small villages, leaving the countryside open for the IRA. Ferns was one of those villages which still retained an operating barracks. Although situated in a busy village, it was still very isolated, with the nearest barracks being in either Inniscorty or Gorey, both several miles away, and in 1921 were not quickly reached as they would be today by modern cars and good roads. The building was located opposite the current courtyard bar and restaurant, which is now the church car park. The barracks was demolished in the late 20th century, but various accounts from the period can help paint a picture of what the building would have looked like. During the War of Independence, it was described as a strongly built two-story building with a valley roof, which was covered by a cage of strong netting wire. This was in place to prevent the attackers from throwing bombs onto the roof, something which had been done in previous attacks on other barracks in County Wexford. The initial explosion would create a hole in the roof in through which grenades and other bombs could then be thrown onto the garrison inside. The building was located a short distance back from the footpath with a low wall in front and was surrounded by a hedged in garden on both sides and to the rear. All windows had steel shutters with loopholes, allowing those inside the barracks to aim out while making it difficult for any attacker attempting to shoot in. The front door was surrounded by barbed wire and had a large chain side, so it could only be opened by about six inches. There were windows on either side of the front door and upstairs, while each gable had a small window. It was known that the back door was the one used most by the police, possibly because the front door would have been more open to attack and being exposed on the street front. The fortification of the barracks combined with its location within the village would have perhaps given its garrison a sense of protection compared to others which were situated in more isolated locations throughout the county. On the night on the 4th of April 1921, the IRA ambushed an RIC patrol within the village, right on the doorstep of the RIC barracks. Joseph Killeen of the Ferns Company was one of those involved in the ambush, and was Vice Commandant of the 3rd Battalion North Wexford Brigade at the time of the attack. He provided us with an account of the incident which he gave some years later in his witness, witness statement to the Bureau of Military History. Joseph Killeen, together with four members of the North Wexford Flying Column, named Stephen Pender, William Cavanagh, Tom Dwyer and Lar Connors, took a position behind a high wall opposite the RIC barracks in Ferns Village. This would have been located directly across from where the barracks would have stood and was now the entrance to Rosemary Heights housing estate between the guard station and the courtyard. Although the high wall does not exist today, it is clearly visible in photographs taken years after the attack in the early 20th century.
Joseph described how he was armed with a 0.45 revolver and had only five rounds of ammunition, while the other men in the party were also similarly armed with revolvers and a few homemade hand grenades. A shortage of ammunition was an ongoing problem for the IRA during the period, and the case of Joseph having five bullets highlights this. Joseph Killeen, in his account of the incident, describes how the target was a composite patrol of six RIC and black and tans, and that they approached in single file on both sides of the street, heading back to their barracks, and that when they came upon their position, they opened fire on them and threw grenades. Contemporary newspaper accounts from the time tell how bombs, revolver and rifle fire were directed on the RIC patrol from behind a high wall along the main street. In response, two of the police fired back on the attackers with their carbines, while the other four constables ran back to the safety of their barracks. Another constable inside the building, upon hearing the gunfire, sent up very lights from inside the building into the night sky to alert neighbouring barracks for assistance. These were similar to modern flares, and their purpose was to alert neighbouring barracks that they needed assistance. Four of the constables managed to reach the safety of the barracks, when suddenly the rear of the building was targeted with gunfire. The newspaper reports describe how so incessant was the fire that it was next to impossible to emerge in safety to go to the assistance of their comrades on the street. However, five of the constables did then emerge, firing at their attackers, whom then fled. Evidence of the short battle could be seen the following morning, as bullet marks were visible in many of the neighbouring buildings and the back of the barracks also. The official report from Dub Dublin Castle stated the fighting lasted for 50 minutes and that no casualties were reported. The following morning, there was a strong police and military presence in the area, and the Miles Kenny from Ballyduff was arrested and brought to Enniscorthy and detained. Although the IRA ambush failed to inflict any casualties in the RIC patrol, it certainly would have had a demoralising effect on their morale, knowing that they were not safe on their own doorstep. Three months later, the local Ferns Company and Flying Column combined will launch another attack on the RIC barracks. The streetscape since the attack of that night has undergone much change. The RIC barracks is now gone, and so was the wall which Joseph Killeen and the others hid behind. Other neighbouring buildings such as the old pot post office, now at the guard station, and school still remain. And if you look close enough in one of the windows of the school, there is a bullet mark in one of the window sills, perhaps a physical reminder of that night's unrest a hundred years ago. Thanks for watching, and if you'd like any more information on the War of Independence at County Wexford, please visit the website wexfordawardofindependence.com.